create a minimum wage, and then thousands of people are supposed to live in it, and it doesn't even have a village square. And the idea was to make as much money as possible out of it. And I think someone was taking pride in their work here, even the person who was loaning the money. But at the same time, if somebody lays your world out on paper, and then it's supposed to be fixed, and the people who live there don't even get to change it after the fact, this is a problem. The greatest places in the world reflect the participation of people over time. Places where they live are interactive and gorgeous and feed our senses. The landscapes, you know, that I just showed you, those people traveling in that landscape, this is the village they live in. 38 outdoor gathering places, 10 times less crime than any neighborhood in Eugene or Portland. The most affluent communities such as this one in Oxford, England, obviously they're interested in gathering places and they make lots of space for themselves, but even the most meager village in the British Islands has at least one village square. Southern Germany, same deal, 12 outdoor gathering places in this view and again less crime. The Powhatan Native Americans would aggregate their architecture around a village commons and define that open space where everyone belonged and time and space and life was not for sale. The Sioux here shown in the lower right forming a circle with their bodies, you know, honoring their ancestors and dreaming of a better future. All about the circle. Polynesia, more gathering places than we even know how to define. Ridiculous. Um, Eastern Europeans here told by the military, oh, it's too dangerous for you to gather in the public commons. The president says you can't do that anymore, so they go onto a rooftop and hold their hands and <laughs> the villages rejoin. This idea that we should just live in this kind of set of boxes, you know, where we go away to work among people we don't tend to get to know and come home to live among people don't, we don't tend to get to know is untenable. The issue of the village is a common cause for all. Lizzie Maggie, this brilliant woman at the, end of, at the beginning of the last century, created the, the game Monopoly as a way for Americans to play the National Land Ordinance of 1785 and for Canadians to play the Dominion Land Survey, both of which commodified the landscape that we were moving into as we went west. And as you play the game, hopefully you discover what Lizzie was hoping that you would see, which is that as you go around and around the board, hopefully pretty quickly you discover that the only form of commons is a jail and a parking lot. <laughs> you might ask yourself, where's the village center? Where's the library? Where's the park? Where's the civic center? Where's all these other forms of commons? And as you keep going around and around the game, gleefully tearing down houses in order to put in hotels, I hope that you notice that you're playing gentrification, as if that's fun. You know, but if you take out a little magnifying glass and look at the houses you're tearing out, you'll see all these displaced families trying to figure out where they're going to go and something about their jobs, their children, where they'll go to school. And then hopefully as you go around and around the board, you'll notice that everything, in fact, is a form of commons, like Pennsylvania Avenue and Baltic Avenue and Broadway. All these streets are for sale, or public utilities and railroads. I mean, is this how we're supposed to play our lives? Because that's the National Land Ordinance that mandated all forms of infrastructure for us. So frankly, I think it's time to stop talking about getting out of the box and thinking out of the box. Freaking get out of the box. <laughs> get out of the box. Hey, look at this. You, just, you know how this game works. You put the whites over here, you put the blacks over here, you play a little segregation without even knowing it. You're about to undertake a little warfare on the grid. You know, and, but I like to play this differently. I like to assume that among those pawns, surely there will be community organizers. They'll all have families and personalities and skills and talents. And you know, at some point, they'll question the process and, and get together with small, in small groups with facilitators, and then question the tall, oppressive ones in the back row with funny hats. And then instead of fighting and killing each other like we do in every revolution, instead maybe, as we've been doing for the last four decades or five, trying out a set of new ideas. James Howard Kunstler, who wrote the book, The Geography of Nowhere, is pretty sure that Americans have lost the ability to create places. He says, it's not bread in the bone, Americans. It may be too late. But I think James has not sat down with second graders. Like, we sat down with these little girls around these street intersection models. We had about six of them. There were six teams of second graders, mostly girls. And we said, OK, girls. We think that you might have the answer. Millions of adults across the country can't seem to figure out how to slow traffic, get kids involved, make interesting places, and get adults to work together. And this little girl right here said, are you serious? She said, she grabs this piece of red clay and she just keeps looking at it. She starts making this little circle. She's like, okay, let me break this down for you. And she lays this little red circle right in the intersection. She's like, 
this is a pony ride. <laughs> like she's talking to us like we're second graders. And she says, I guarantee if you get a pony ride going in the middle of the intersection, everyone's going to get out of their car, they're going to pet the ponies, ride the ponies, and start talking to each other. She's got a little pool over here and some chairs and a little building and these other little features. I don't know what this little snowman guy is doing. But then her friend here says, I have got such a better idea than that. I know for sure that if we put an ice cream parlor right in the middle of the street over here, everyone's going to get out of the cars. You can have rice cream and soy delicious and all the flavors you can imagine. We can have little tables and chairs around the edges. I don't know what this thing is. It looks like a giant tongue. But there's an archway there. And their teacher is saying, are you sure, girls? Are you sure? Our cars, our streets just for cars? And this little girl says, well, what are your priorities? Actually, what they've just done, no, no, tell me if I'm wrong, but the greatest gathering places in all the world work like this. Interactive, interesting, functional spaces in the middle with interesting activities happening on the edges. And whether you're talking about the Piazza Navona in, in Rome, or the Piazza del Campo, or, or, or Spanish plazas and, and great Greek spaces, this is how they work. You can do this again. Like this neighborhood. Um, yeah, but sometimes the process can get a little out of hand. <laughs> you can definitely, I mean, all this fossil fuel burning going on, you can definitely sympathize with the Tyrannosaurus Rex, can't you? Superman's helping out. You know, a village square, I mean, it wasn't even until 1512 that people got to get married in churches, and before that, a traditional wedding was right there in the village crossroads at the center of the village. So that gathering place, that village center, that commons is sacred. I mean, it becomes sacred just because people use it every day. They, they fall in love there. What we've been doing in Portland is to do this all over the city, everywhere that we can. And then it's, you know, it's happening in all these other cities as well now. But coming to Dignity Village and how this all relates, I want to start off just thinking about Joseph Campbell, the great comparative mythologist who many of you probably saw in that famous v, um, PBS series years ago, uh, narrated or uh, guided by Bill Moyers. He's, one of the things that Campbell said was that, he asked a question. He, he said, you're wondering where King Arthur is. Everybody keeps wondering about the king, the return of the king. Where will, when will the king come back? This great archetype everyone keeps waiting for. He said, where is the shaman in our landscape? In fact, that, that particular human archetype can't trade their time for money. And they depend on us in order for them to emerge. He said, King Arthur is living in the street. You might have passed him already in your car. You may have made a, made a judgment about him, but he's sitting there trying to come through a transcendent experience in order to come back. Whoa. <laughs> but I can tell you, at, at Dignity Village, I've certainly met St. John the Baptist. <laughs> um, all right, so this is, a, this is a diagram from Andrew, who was just up here previously, just charting some of the really organized um, initiatives around the country where people are trying to take care of each other, like that woman I re referred to at the beginning. Um, it's kind of happening all over the place, and many more informal ones, for sure. But in Portland, this was configured from the beginning as a nomadic form of village. Now remember, villages are both settled and nomadic, and they're both legitimate. And in fact, before you even figure out what it looks like, if you decide you are a villager, then the village exists. So initially, it was in the form of tents, and they clustered their tents in circles, and then they had a representative structure, so that each circle was represented in a village council. And as they were swept by the police to go from location to location, they kept refining their idea and they kept trying to, to, to link with various agencies and especially the city council. They were sort of going across the city looking for a next place, looking for a next place. And they became these sort of media figures, actually, with the media interviewing them. They became known on the, on the news and people began to refer, you know, in the homes of Portland, Oregon, to Jack Tafari and other characters of the, uh, of the village. But early on, they were supported by organizations, especially the Unitarian Church and City Repair and uh, Sisters of the Road Cafe, in formulating their, villi their, their vision, because we knew that the city council would need a proposal. They would need some ideas that were crystallized and well-organized. So we started to diagram what the village would look like in plans and sections and elevations, the idea of an enclosure around the village as they're building it up. It's a very interesting document, and we created all of these different um, sort of design ideas, like this one at the top there about a roof that would float over the tents and incl an enclosing wall that would make sure that everyone was safe right away and out of the weather as we started to immediately transition 
Kind of like nature does with succession, the idea of a forest in succession, but with people kind of recovering and then building their infrastructure up into something astounding, we would hope. So like this. So I'm just going to show you all these different documents. I mean, if I show you a bunch of paper with text on it, I mean, usually people take it seriously. I promise you that these are all actual words. <laughs> so here's the idea. It kind of begins in a little fragmentary way with a few pieces, and then it sort of fills out. And at the time, we were getting ready to make a proposal to one of the city commissioners in Portland, uh, Eric Sten, and we knew some things about Eric. First of all, we knew he liked Star Wars, and we knew he liked donuts. And we were going to meet him in the morning, so we kind of configured our design um, to respond to the things we knew about Eric. But here you see little pieces of, of it kind of then aggregating, and that became the first piece. We were going to build other pieces that would fill in the village as we were adding capacity. But it, frankly, at the beginning, if all you have is a spool and a ceramic jug for your watering hole, like that's the center of your village. You know, the great villages of the world have beautiful water features at the center and the commons. Here they are, actually generating it from the most rudimentary stuff, and that's the center of the village. And, you know, you might say, well, that's not good enough for my neighborhood, and fine. But what you're seeing is something that is so exquisitely human. It really bears appreciation. University of Architecture students came up to Portland, and they, the design classes generated many different solutions. But we kept working on this idea of something that would look like the Millennium Falcon, crossed with a donut. <laughs> we were going to go meet with our favorite commissioner. So we said, don't worry, we'll bring the donuts. It was an 8 o'clock meeting, and we showed up, and we had this whole plate of donuts with our model in the middle, and some coffee. This model. And he picked it up, and he was holding his coffee, and he was smiling so broadly that we were all laughing. And he knew what we were doing, and the, the meeting went so beautifully. So here it was, this idea that, you know, at first we'd create a very palatable architectural expression, like some of the best stuff that you could imagine, and within it, people would immediately be able to camp and be safe. Um, and then as the conversation progressed, the city council said, no, you really don't have to go to that extreme. We can do something that's a lot easier on you, but let's lay out the infrastructure of places and pathways and gates. Where will your gardens go? How would you handle things on site in terms of waste? Because we've been talking about um, alternative uh, waste systems and water catchment systems and such. All these like, green features that everybody's really falling in love with now. And we said, you know, well, well we could do a transitional uh, phase like this where we did put maybe bamboo and greenhouse plastic over the tents so that it would look like these beautiful shell-like forms and eventually it would look like this. And this would be a reflection of the recovery of the people who live there. They would build the most participatory, walkable, aesthetic community. So you wouldn't have to go across the ocean anymore to visit a real village. And the city council was, you know, saying, wow, that's, that's a big dream, but you seem serious. So it looked like this at first, then it might look like this, and then it would look like this. Pretty amazing. A place where just about anyone would want to live. There is a limousine sort of pictured in the foreground here. <laughs> But that's what we're talking about, a lovely place with a very distinct sense of identity. So Dignity Village has just a few basic rules. You know, you, you can't hurt people, you can't do drugs, you can't do alcohol. And the village is self-organized with a council. People don't get in if they're aberrant. They can't bring gigantic issues into the place. And if there is anything that goes wrong, they have to leave the village for a period of time, or maybe forever. So for those of you who, who, who have, you know, very respectable um, concerns, that's, that is, is one um, aspect of uh, Opportunity Village that I know that they're already planning on. Um, because they're not interested in just dealing with drama all the time. So here's another picture. This was proposed, this was shown to the city council as sort of maybe the ultimate form of what the village center could become. Oh, I'm sorry. Lots of drawings, lots of content. This whole proposal was very, very thick and well considered. And I'm glad to tell you, the content of this came entirely from the villagers themselves. You would be surprised how many ideas um, are resonant in the people who are living on the street. They, they are paying attention as well. They're reading the paper. So these lovely cottages with beautiful gardens, kitchen gardens with herbs and edibles all around, natives. Little storefronts where the things that they know how to do can be presented for sale to visitors from the village. So there can be a local economy. And just text after text having to do with um, safety. I can't even read this stuff without my glasses. Uh, yeah, infrastructure systems, safety, 
There you go. Fire lanes, setbacks and pathways, st fire stations, smoke detectors, villagers will be trained, designated as resident fire marshals all across the village. Um, water catchment systems to be used for fighting certain kinds of fires. Um, Non-flammable roofing, like the building codes of the village address fire concerns and aesthetics. Energy systems, like immediate energy systems that are responsible, and then long-term strategies for sustainability. Yeah, water strategies, sewage, compost, recycling. Um, yeah, overview of the population codes. It just, I mean, I mean, just, just take me for granted. This is a whole lot of stuff, and I typed it up, darn it. Um, here's the, here's a little sort of view of what we did in the initial few stages in terms of the plan, and it was attempting to be like some of the most interesting villages to walk in. Uh, here's some of our initial cottage designs. These are strategies for buildings that could actually be moved if necessary, and in some cases duplexes and fourplexes that could come apart and be popped back together elsewhere. Um, and then all sorts of uh, different considerations. Oh yeah, budgets. We actually budgeted for this in terms of how you would do it from a community participation perspective, state codes that we were missing, that we were addressing, and then here's sort of this ultimate view of, of, of what we were intended to do on the site where we, uh, where we ultimately landed the village, and right away they got going. They built a dome of democracy, and they said, well, we're going to be like Washington, D.C. That dome comes from native people anyway, let's, let's sort of take it and use it again. Village tower, this woman that cobbled together this house on the, on the uh, right, this was the first time she'd ever been able to create a place that she could call her own. But the idea was not to be in that state for very long. But you can see there were raised planters, kids were getting involved from middle schools to help out, fiberglass cows for some reason. <laughs> this guy actually wrapped his house in a greenhouse fabric so that it would be warm during the winter time. Um, but it didn't, even, it didn't even have to go through the winter. Um, here's another one, very low income, but um, one of the first passive game buildings on the site. Uh, immediately they had porta potties on the site and then they started to work on longer term solutions. This is the meeting house that they built that everyone in the village could fit in with a community hearth. You can see that it's, it's repurposing recycled materials out of the waste stream, but really lovely. I mean, Mondrian could not create a more lovely expression, I think, than this. And this is what it looked like inside, and they were mostly working with 2x4s less than 6 feet long. So talk about uh, ingenuity and adversity. This is the village council table, Knights of the Round Table, they called it. Said, we're the knights, we're back. Um, so very, very beautiful structural systems. The first wind turbine in the city of Portland. Uh, these are some of their firefighting stations. They like to joke about how, well, yeah, they, they pull water off of a gutter into a rain barrel. And then they have a firefighting axe, and they can get some water out of the barrel if necessary. But they can also open up the medicine cabinet, get out a fire extinguisher, close the cabinet, look in the mirror, and fix their hair because they're about to become a hero. <laughs> you know, you've got to have a sense of humor. Um, this is now the, the, the community meeting house. This is now the main space that everyone in the village can fit into when it's cold. This is the village center, um, where they've painted this lovely Celtic design on the pavement. This is the, these are the village showers. Now again, they've built all this stuff. This is the, one of the first straw bale buildings built in the city, and that's the uh, village store. These are, their, uh, these are their dumpsters and recycling systems. Here's a cross section of one of the little houses that they've, that they've been building. And here's a, a detail. They built five houses in 10 days um, using straw clay insulation and earthen plaster. So these are what are known as natural buildings. And all of the studs came out of the waste stream. And these buildings, these cottages cost an average of $187 a house. This is a lot. Yeah. Some of them you would really like to have in your backyard. This is just kind of modernist, I suppose. I just love this one. I helped this woman paint her house, and uh, she said, pink and green. I said, okay. <laughs> I really liked it. This one. It's another one. Like, really beautiful. You're taking, you're taking stuff out of the waste stream and making craftsman-style houses out of them. This one's got drying plaster, but you can see that this man here has built this house. He only intends to be in the village for five months. He's trying to transition out. And so he's built it for other people who will come after him. There's another one. Okay, I took the whole idea of a home being the castle very seriously. 
<laughs> this sense of delight and, and color. When you, when you think about a homeless village, especially as the media, the media doesn't tend to be very helpful. And they'll use words like camp, and that will conjure images of um, plastic bags blowing the wind and stuff. But what we're talking about is verdant gardens, edibles in their midst, and uh, well-tended places, places to sit everywhere you go, and no cars, a walkable community that is car-free. And frankly, as you know, once you get out of your tent and you build your house, uh, then you'll get around to painting murals on your place. This is a famous place. People all over the world are talking about it now. One of the most lovely places in the world. I don't know if you've heard of the great uh, French cave, La Cau, but this is uh, the Las Cau, thank you. Yeah, this is referring to that. Lovely. This is called the Cat House. This woman has a particular affection for cats, so every cat in the village has a little portrait. This is their greenhouse. It's just an amazing place. This is what it looks like. This was drawn by one of our interns recently from the University of Oregon. And uh, the Oregonian hasn't told the story that the village is finished and it's also helping other places around the country. They continue to call for the closure of the village. My gosh, it's substandard. But what would happen? I mean, with a population that refuses to even acknowledge the problem, what would happen? Again, people would be having to live in doorways and under bridges again. So here's just an example um, up in Olympia. They call this uh, Camp Quixote. It's beautifully organized. These are all um, built for around 5,000, so they're a little bit higher standard of construction. This is called Rosinante. This is named after the horse of Don Quixote, but it is a mobile construction uh, in the upper left. The one is a mobile construction workshed for building for homeless people. It goes wherever people need to build stuff. And then in the lower right, that's one of the houses of Camp Quixote, the first prototype. This is called R2D2, or Right to Dream 2, Right to Sleep and Dream 2. Um, this is actually in downtown Portland, um, and it's supported by the property owner. Um, it's enclosed very quickly in this screen of doors, uh, which is a little unusual, but it's kind of like a, an art project. <coughs> You come around the corner, there's an entrance and a security security uh, desk, and people have to follow rules, they have to be um, respectful to each other, and uh, the whole goal is to transition out of there, back into society, back to their families, but they need a place to be stable in order to do that. We have to support these people in order to assist them. If we're afraid of them, we're not going get, to get any, feel any safer until we help them, quite apparently. This is a little bit more about that. So that's what I brought tonight. I think we're going to go back.